Since there's already a lot of reviews on the S1 online, I thought I'd make one on what I wanted a review to be about, questions I was still asking after watching these reviews. Here's my S1, just kidding, this is like for clickbait, I guess, I don't know. This is my F3, and it's reminiscent of the S1 because they look similar, and that's why I'm holding it and there's no other reason. Anyway, today I had the chance to play around with a Panasonic S1, the final firmware 1.0 version, and here are some things that I'd like to have known in other reviews, questions that I asked that I found out testing it. So right off the bat, I thought it was gonna be insanely heavy. All the reviewers, everyone online, they're like, this thing is a tank. This thing's so heavy, it's gonna fatigue you. And I, I pick it up, it's the same weight as my D610, like slightly heavier than a D750, about the same weight as a D810. My 5D, it weighs about the exact same. So this is only a heavy camera if you're used to like a GH5 or a smaller, Fuji. If you have an X-H1 or a full frame camera besides, you know, like a Sony, this is going to feel absolutely like a normal camera. It did not feel heavy really whatsoever. Another thing that I was sort of wondering is there was a reviewer online and he's like, because I had the D750 and I hated the buttons. They were so mushy in the weather ceiling. I hated it. Some people like it. I didn't like it at all. So a reviewer said, Oh, this button right here is super mushy. So I, I'm like, I don't want to pre-order because I have super OCD of buttons and stuff. But I push it when I'm trying it out and it feels completely like a normal, uh, a normal button. And the lock, I thought it would be like some flimsy, weird gimmicky thing. Like this thing doesn't move or it, it just looked like it could be kind of gimmicky. It feels fantastic. Every single button on the camera feels just amazing like here 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 just every the shutter everything feels like a total solid super nice camera that out of the way if people said oh i lift it up and i go like this and it feels like the greatest camera i've ever held in my entire life i would not say that it didn't feel that amazing it did feel very good though it did not feel bad oh, it felt nice it just wasn't like oh my life is transformed so you know, you have to have, you can't be having these huge expectations for that. Anyway, weight aside, the top button, weird power button, I thought it would be super weird. It looks, in the pictures, it looks like this flimsy, really thin, break-offable thing. It, it was fantastic. It's just on, off, on, off. You get totally, absolutely used to it. All the other buttons, the screen, when it comes out, my D750 felt like a toy. It felt like it could break off. No offense to D750 users, it's a nice camera. I just didn't really like mine whatsoever. But this, it's fantastic. And in order to go to the, the Fuji like sort of tilty mode right here, you have to like push down this thing. So it's very, it's not gimmicky whatsoever. It feels like a well machined, let's be cliche and call it tank. Aside from the weight and you know, all of that comfort wise, I carried it around all day, about four hours, and towards the end of those four hours, my hands were starting to get really intense blisters. Like, they hadn't developed yet, obviously, but it was getting very red, and um, I was developing blisters. If I shot for another hour, I would totally have blisters. It's completely different on this F3. See, it's like machined metal, but a fair point. There were no camera straps so for about four hours i set it down a little bit throughout the day but i basically held that for four hours the heavy heavy camera like a five weight of a 5d imagine it has a really coarse grip on it which i'm not the biggest fan of that's what kind of gave me blistering but if i had a camera strap it wouldn't have gotten to that point so it could wear away with age i have no idea but i'm not going to be carrying my camera on a normal day for you know four hours without a camera strap i'm gonna put it on a tripod a gimbal shoot video you know i'll carry it in my hands but i'm not gonna you know hike around with it like some youtubers like to do because i like camera straps because i don't like to drop my camera because i've done that before another thing people were asking was can you control manual settings in super slow-mo like above 120 i think it is i didn't dive in that much in the slow-mo, super slow-mo that is, 
and when I shot it was an automatic, but there could be a setting to turn it off automatic in super slow-mo. I also noticed a bit of a jitter when manual focusing in super slow-mo. I had the lens set to linear focus instead of focus by wire, and I noticed a little bit of super quick, you know, electronic jerking, which I don't know if that can be adjusted in the sensitivity settings. Although this isn't much of a concern if you're adapting manual lenses. As far as slow-mo quality, it looks exceptional. Even though it's pretty compressed 1080p, the files are really gorgeous. One of the sad things was, since I use lots of vintage Nikkor Prime lenses, because I do a lot of videography, I like to manual focus, I wanted to see what this camera would do with a uh, prime lens. So I'm like, I see image stabilization on the lens. I'm like, I'm turning that off. I wanna use the beautiful in-body stabilization on this thing. And I'm taking these shots, they look pretty good, but I'm like, this really doesn't look that good. Like, it's okay, but it's not that smooth at all. I turned it on for like just two times, and I'm like, that is insane. I guess I have to shell out two grand for some lenses, but whatever, the footage looks freaking nice. Color science is fantastic. So the image stabilization. I was later told by a Panasonic rep, if you turn off the image stabilization on their you know, auto lenses, it turns off the entire system. So I was shooting like on a 1DX or something, a solid sensor. So that's why it was so shaky. So this IBIS, unfortunately I didn't have a chance to really try it. It's so good that some people took a pretty crispy image of the Capitol building where I live, two second exposure handheld. So the lens helped out a bit, but five and a half stops comes from the body, half a stop comes from the lens. So you can get like 80%, 90% of the way there with outer lens, with just primes. So I'm sat, I don't think there's a way I could have tested it out, but I should have used the lens, you know, to get that crispy, crispy footage with the uh, IBIS. Speaking about overheating for a moment, there were some people that said this camera overheats, which this is true, but not really at all. So I shot for about four hours taking photos using the EVF, using like looking through images, shooting 4K, shooting 4K 60, shooting 4K photo burst, and it got very hot towards the bottom. It was heating up, but it got probably 95 degrees, which, I don't know. My laptop, it, that thing can get like 130 degrees. It's giving me burns on my thighs, but you know, it's a, it's a workhorse. It's, it keeps going. It keeps chugging. So I never had a performance problem with the heat. It gets warm, but I think any camera shooting full frame 4K 60 cropped a bit. I think any camera doing that will get a little bit warm. So it did get warm, which concerning of overheating, but you know, there's laptops that get like 150 degrees and they work just fine. So it'll keep your hands toasty in the winter, but I didn't have a problem in performance. As far as touch screen, it's not as intuitive as per se the D850, which I love. It's just right there. Maybe that'll be fixed with firmware or, you know, maybe there's a sensitivity setting. I found you had to go like this a bit. You had to pinch a couple times more, whereas the D50 was pretty there, but it's pretty solid. You can go through menus. You don't have to use any of the buttons or anything, but the mushy button that actually felt great, it has a wheel dial, so you can use that. You can also use the joystick, so there's so many options to go through menus, and the touchscreen is great. One of the weird things is with the autofocus little lines, they look super pixely, which is weird because the screen is insanely high resolution. I don't know, I usually use manual focus, so I don't need any of those little boxes things. I didn't really go through autofocus because I don't ever use autofocus, but from what I saw, it's pretty fantastic. So if I ever got a autofocus lens, I would be happy to use it on this system. Image transferring. I would like to know about image transferring. I went in the Wi-Fi setting. I had to get an app. They said they're gonna make another app which works better for the S1 but I used their app and I was able to transfer a image, a JPEG um, over to my phone. High resolution, looks great. A Panasonic rep told me you can also do video, 1080, not 4K. And if you go into the settings, you can change it to send raw, which I think is great. I've never used Panasonic before, but 
when I had a Nikon D3400, you could send images via like SnapBridge, but it gave you like 16 megapixel compressy JPEGs, which was awful. So this is great if you're traveling and you need a photo or some video, super quick, super handy. Another feature you can do if you're missing out on that flippy screen, which honestly, after using it, I don't see any really gripe. I was using a Canon 60D over the weekend and I was like this and I have my camera strap right here and the camera strap just sort of gets in the way. If you're plugging in an HDMI, the screen flips out, gets in the way, it's easy to break off. I don't know. There's pros and cons to flippy screens. If you're a vlogger, it's amazing, but I don't really vlog that much. So this isn't that bad. I don't really like being positioned like this. I like to be straight in front of my subject with that screen right there. So this is actually fantastic. I'm actually glad it has this screen and it's very, very, very well built. The flippy portrait bit of it, I think that's slightly gimmicky. It's pretty cool. It doesn't feel cheap at all. So it's nice and I'm glad it's there rather than it not being there. A Panasonic rep told me that they are working with Atomos to potentially add raw external recording. So this isn't 100% verified, but it's a very big possibility. He says they're working with them to potentially do that. So if that is the case, then that's great. You know, you don't have to get a, a Nikon to shoot raw or whatever black magic, which I think is fantastic because I would rather shoot full frame and get that easy bokeh with some cheap vintage prime lenses rather than shelling out for expensive APS-C lenses with a speed booster. As far as battery life is concerned, I was shooting throughout the day Four hours, I don't know if it was 100% charged. Some people could have used the camera before me, gotten some use out of it. I think it was probably 90% charged, I don't know. But I was using it and it died on me, but I shot loads of photos, JPEGs plus RAW, so it's you know processing both of that, and I'm shooting video. 4K photo, 4K video, all that, 60p, and it was getting pretty warm, and it died. I didn't have any power saving mode on, but I think it's pretty good. I shot a lot. If that thing was 100% filled up and I had power saving mode on, I think that'd be fantastic. It's better than, you know, getting a black magic and getting a big chunky cannon battery on a cage like this and carrying that around all day. And then, you know, popping another one in. I think it's right there. You change it, you use a grip or something like that. Black magic can't do a grip, but you know, it's more of a cinema camera versus a photography and cinema camera, which this is. After watching videos, I was told the EVF would be life-changing, just absolutely insane. It, I don't know, it was pretty good, but it wasn't life-changing. I compared it to a Sony a7 III. a7 III looked pretty pixely. The Panasonic looked a lot less pixely. I definitely didn't see any pixels, but it looks like a digital screen. It looks like a fantastic digital screen, but I think People exaggerate how good it is. It's definitely amazing, but I don't think it'll, you know, blow your mind away and ah, so great. But it is, it is definitely pretty good. I don't think you can compare it to an optical viewfinder, but as I was shooting with my Nikon and the S1, what I really noticed, I was missing focus because I couldn't see exactly where I was in focus. It couldn't magnify the image so I could get a tight focus and then snap the image. So I had a much larger hit rate with the S1. Another thing, which is very important to me at least, when I was taking photos with my Nikon, I had to go like this and test if it was overexposed, adjust. I can usually get it in three shots, but still, that's three shots of chimping where you'd have zero with the Panasonic. I wasn't really into the battery grip before coming, but after seeing it, it's pretty nice. It's a nice battery grip. The thing I didn't really, you know, love is when you have it right here, you have, you're holding the camera. It's not like with other battery grips I've used, your eye is not right here. The eyepiece is like right here. So you have to lift it even higher than you would imagine, but you get used to it pretty easily. You know, I'd rather have battery life and have it look like a handsome machine versus not. Anyway, I did a test with my Nikon versus the S1 and also a Sony a7 III versus the S1. The Sony videos did not write to my card, unfortunately, so I don't have any of that footage, but I did hold them both. The Sony compared to the S1 is, the Sony's so nice. The Sony's everything just shoved into this tiny, tiny little package. It's high quality, everything is where you need it to be. 
my pinky didn't really come off of the edge. I actually really liked the Sony. And I like the zoom system in the Sony for manual focusing more than the S1, I think, even though the S1 is good. But aside from that, the Sony, the, all the dials feel jammed together. So when you're like this, you sort of have to awkwardly put your finger over here. And with stuff like ISO, I'm sure you can set quick buttons probably, but it just seemed really confusing. I had to go in through here, scroll this wheel, whereas the S1 has these nice little ISO buttons so you can change everything in an instant. They had these little sort of bead things that stick out, which kind of bothered me, but honestly, I think that'd be over in like a day. It was much more intuitive using it on the S1. And having barely used Sony, I was digging through the menu. People say the menu's bad. I don't think it's that bad, but after I was trying to find a certain setting to turn off noise reduction or whatever, even though I don't know if that's a thing on Sony's, I was trying to turn that off in video. I was trying to adjust picture profile. It took me about 10 minutes to go through all of these things, having never used Sony. I've never used a Panasonic before, yet I was able to find these things in like 20 seconds. So that's something to keep in mind. The Panasonic is much more sort of intuitive. You know where everything is, just sort of naturally. You can go like this, use this dial for your shutter. You can use this one for your aperture. ISO is right here. And white balance has a feature. I don't know if other Panasonics have this. Whereas to get the white balance on my Nikon, I have to go in crop mode. I have to zoom in really close. I have to push the white balance button wait for it to blink, set pre, and then I go like this, and it says good pre. Whereas this is much like the Magic Lantern cameras I've used. You push white balance and it does this nice tiny little crop. You point it towards your gray card and it collects it immediately and there's loads of custom white balance settings. Honestly, at the end of the day, it was heavy, but it was as heavy as my other camera, as my D610. The Sony just felt there's a smooth grip, there wasn't a rough grip. So I liked the Sony a lot more for that. It seemed more metallic, more solid, more shoved together. But one thing, whenever I was adjusting settings, I'm pretty dependent on my top LCD. This doesn't have one, my D610 has one. And I think they are so, so useful because I just go like this, I adjust you know, the settings I want, I know exactly which setting I'm at just by one little glance. With the Sony, however, I found myself going like this and basically chimping, but instead of taking photos, I was in the menu system. So I would much rather save myself time there. I don't shoot either, but overall, I kind of wanted to go more towards the Sony because I was having these blisters on my hands, but the color science in the Panasonic beats it, par none, par none. The Sony's color science isn't as bad as people say, but the Panasonic's is absolutely outstanding, especially when I had it in the Cinelog V, Cinelog D, or whatever that is, I've never used Panasonic, but it had crispy, just gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous skin tones straight out of the camera, which I really, really enjoyed. The Sony has a better battery life, but with the Panasonic, it's not that bad if you set all the power settings correctly. One of the reps told me about the IBIS and said it has the exact same performance as the GH5, which I think looks killer. So if that is true, pop on some primes, get gorgeous footage, put it on a gimbal, no more micro jitters, make it look like you're locked on rails. That's something that I would really, really like. And the 60p looks gorgeous in 4K. So that's something that the Sony doesn't quite have. So Am I comfortable pre-ordering one of these and not getting the Sony? I think so. I really wanted to get the Sony because not necessarily lightweight, but because I liked that grip. I liked that all shoved together, but because of the lack of the top screen, the lack of the ergonomics, the lack of the quick changing features and everything, I don't think I could do it. I think I'd rather have blisters in my hands, but I would get calluses, I would use a camera strap, and I would use it on a gimbal most of the time. So I don't think that would happen. So that is my sort of overlook of the Panasonic after testing it for four hours today from our 1.0. I will upload a video of footage I shot with the S1, not as smooth as possible because I didn't have IBIS turned on, but I'm sure it will look good. The footage looks absolutely killer. And when I turned off noise reduction and all of that, it still looks great. The plasticky skin tones I was worried about, 
they don't seem to be there. When you push it high, they kind of get there, but compared to mushy DSLR footage and other footage I've seen, I don't see anything that looks better than this. I think the Blackmagic Pocket 4K looks slightly better, but I think the color science on the S1 is much better, and I think I'd rather have good color science than a slightly, slightly smoother looking image. As far as dynamic range, I didn't do very intensive tests. It looks about as good as my Nikon. I don't want to fully judge it because it doesn't have RAW and we don't have Vlog for video, but not amazing from what I've seen. It's definitely not bad. If you underexpose, it's going to be good. And when they release these other ways, I think it's going to be fantastic. Definitely much better than the low dynamic range of earlier Canon cameras and even modern Canon cameras like the 5D Mark III or something like that. I would much rather have the S1. So while there are some things I really don't like about the S1, the amount of redeeming qualities I found from actually testing it made me confident in thinking that I should pre-order this camera and I think it is a quality option from what I have seen.